We are mindful, and I want to begin, obviously, in my, my time with a, uh, just a, a prayer for those around the world. We know the world's in turmoil. Um, I had an opportunity this week to be at the, on vacation. I'm still on vacation today, so you're going to get a vacation sermon. It might be longer than normal because I've had time to rest this week. I've slept almost every day, and I, it's kind of like recharged, and I've been plugged into the, to that uh, beachside bed. We were staying in a place, Wendy got a deal, and when Wendy gets deals, you got to beware when you get there, all right? So um, you had to look where you step, make sure you didn't step from the first floor to the second floor. Uh, but it was a, it was a, it was a deal. So uh, it was definitely an Edisto Beach old house from back in the day. It's an original. So she got us a, a deal. So there was indoor plumbing, just for the record. All right. So, y'all, listen. We had a good time this week. I know the world is in turmoil, and it looks like everything's falling out of control. You're watching the news. Depends on where you get your propaganda from. Um, and it is propaganda, by the way. Just back in the day when I was in naval intelligence, we'd be sending stuff home from outside the world when the Gulf War was going on, and I'd watch the news from outside the world and watch everything was opposite of being reported that was actually happening. I'm creating the news, and it's been reported totally opposite. So don't put your faith and trust, and whatever your choice of three-letter or four-letter news station is, uh, put your choice and your trust in a three-letter word named G-O-D, capital G, because he's in charge, Amen. Times have to get worse, right? Last days, look at 1 Timothy, or excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 3. In these last days, perilous times will come. Now, we don't want anyone to die. We don't want to get hurt. We don't want crime to rise. We don't want war. We don't want any of that stuff. But we know it's going to get worse before he comes. And we just accept what the Word of God says and say, come, Lord Jesus, come. We still pray for the peace of Israel. We still pray for the protection of the martyred saints, or the saints that are about to be martyred. We pray for all the things that are happening in the world. But let me encourage you just from my time at the beach this week. Me and Wendy got up yesterday morning and watched that sunrise. And I asked, uh, what time would it be risen? I said, what time? Siri, what time will the sunrise at Edisto Beach? And did you know Siri was exactly right? Do you know Why? Because God is a God of order. He's a God of order. That sun comes up every morning like he tells it to. It didn't stop. We say coming up. We understand, uh, how, we understand a little bit about how the, the, the universe works. But guess what the tides did? The tides that actually came only so far and went back out. You know why? Read the book of Job. He tells the tide how far it will come in. It, the Bible says very clearly he told it where the deadline is. This is how far you'll go. Now, I know storms bring up other uh, levels of the ocean, but he tells the storm, even the tides, how far they will come. Our God is in charge of the world and everything in it. Our God is the God of the Bible. Now, I brought this exaggerated pencil in here just to show you something that you really need to teach your children how to write with a pencil. If you send them to our school, we're going to try to correct the problems that you sent us with, right? You got kids writing like this. You got kids writing like this, like this. Like this, what's the proper way of writing with a pencil? Yes, right? There is a proper way that actually helps your hand so you don't actually cause injury to your hand. But what's the most important part of writing with a pencil or pen? Getting the writing assignment done. And today I thought it would be appropriate that we actually look at this exaggerated pencil because James is going to say, I mean, John's going to say multiple times, I'm writing to you. I'm writing to you. And who actually empowered him or inspired him to write to you? The Holy Spirit. So God told him to write down. He used his personality. Uh, he used, obviously, everything that he has, education, his socioeconomic status, whatever he had to offer. He put that before the Lord, and the Lord said, I'm going to use you. And so James, is, is, I mean, John's writing today. We're going to go to James too. John's writing, saying, I'm writing to you. He's writing on behalf of whom? God. Very good. He's writing on behalf of God, and he's writing to who? To believers, to Christians. Chris read that uh, uh, 1 John 2, 1, my little children, that reference right there is to those who are in the family of God, okay? I'm writing to you, little children. So I'm going to lay the pencil here, and I want you to think about, if God took the time to write you a letter, don't you think you should read it? Because so many of us, and we do counseling, we're like, Pastor, and we start crying, right? And we're like, but God, if God was who says he is and God is faithful, God would do this, this, and this. News for you, news flash. You're not God and you don't know what he would do. Isaiah said his ways are higher than your ways. Is that true? 
Because if you'd fix it, guess what you'd do? You'd tear everything else up to fix it. And you'd start with your family first. You'd guard your own personal family more than anyone else's. And sometimes your family has to have hurt in order to turn to the God who can help. And how many mamas and grandmamas and daddies and granddaddies get in the way of God trying to fix it so that actually God would heal them and bring them closer to him? Sometimes it's called, we call it today, we don't say it anymore because it's not politically correct, tough love. You want to live like that child? You want to act like that son or daughter? Then go enjoy, because back in the day it was called sowing your oats. Have you ever heard that, those words? Your, your bitter oats. But if you want to go sow them, guess what? You don't put those in a garden. Where do you put them? In a pasture. So you want to go live with the animals? Go like the prodigal son and go. Go like the prodigal daughter that you might be and go. What happens is I'm going to pray for you every day. But you got to go. John here is talking to the children of God. People, listen, I'm writing to this so you won't sin. Now, do we sin? Yes, every day you got to read it in context. We read it every we, we know that we sin, but we have an advocate the, before the Father, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's read together what he says. We're going to pick up in verse 12, uh, chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. And we're, if you haven't been here with us, you can go back and pick these up. We've, we started the series a few weeks ago, and we took a break for Easter and Palm Sunday. But now we're right back into this. So he's going to say it again. Here, here's the big pencil letter. I write to you, what does your Bible say? Little children are young ones because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Couldn't go on any further. Who is his in that, in that category? His name. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't make a don't make mistake. It's not just your sins are forgiven. You don't get your sins forgiven just because you think you, they're forgiven. You don't get your sins forgiven just because you want them forgiven. You have to get your sins forgiven when you actually go in and through the blood of Jesus Christ. No one wants to talk about blood anymore because it's like, like I told you even before, it's getting worse now. When you go to Chick-fil-A, you don't say, I would like a dead chicken with half of his breast cut out, put on a wheat bun with a pickle. Anybody ever order Chick-fil-A like that? Yeah, try it sometime. It'll freak out whoever's taking your order, right? Give me the, give me the dead chicken, number one, right? That's it. We, we just want to go. We don't want to talk about it dead. We don't want to talk about blood loss. We just, want, just give me a number one with a sweet tea, right? Is that how you order? Uh, you don't go to McDonald's and say, listen, I'd like that murdered or that killed cow. I'd like the one that was actually died in Texas, that, that particular one. Uh, you, don't, you don't ask for the animal. You ask for what? Number one, have you guys let you, uh, when we came to Aiken, we were traumatized because hash is not hash here in Aiken. I, I've adjusted to it, but it, this, is not, this is not hash we serve here. Have you guys actually ever think about hash when you're eating it? You know what's in that bowl? Yes. Uh, okay, I'll leave it to that. The point being is we've so traumatized the way and we want to shelter our kids, we don't talk about blood. Even if you look at our Bible stories, I told Kristen, tell the whole story. David the Goliath, he takes a stone and he slings it and he hits the giant head and David won the battle for the day. No, David took Goliath's own sword, he cut his head off, he took all of his armor and took his head to the king and said, he's dead. Is that a guarantee he's dead? Yes. And then he kept all the armor for himself. So we don't tell that story because it's, ugh, it's gross. And it's the reality of life. You understand that when we read the word of God. So the reality of here is we do not get our sins forgiven except through the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There's no cleaner avenue. There's no filtered avenue. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that you can have your sins forgiven. And it's Jesus Christ, listen, the God of the Bible. Make sure you don't stray from that. I heard a preacher this week say the Bible contains words that God wants us to know. No, the Bible is God's holy and errant word. It's not just some ideas that some people put together because it was a good thought here and there. This is God's word inspired from heaven. God said, write this down. And holy men of God that were moved by the Spirit of God wrote down the scriptures as we have, those to, uh, have them today. Now, it's in our language. Are there any errors in, in transition? Yes, sometimes if I put a J, like if I don't put a... My glasses on, sometimes I can't tell a J from a T, right? Or, or if it's a capitalized, if it's an F or a T, I can't, but sometimes I can't see that. So there's a small uh, typographical, if we would call those errors. But the, the Word of God is the Word of God. So listen, I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven for Jesus' name's sake. Don't lose that. Verse 13, I write to you fathers because you have known him. Who's him? 
Jesus, and, and you can say God there, who is from the beginning or from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. Who's the Father? should be capitalized if you have a new King James Bible. The Father is God the Father. We see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We'll see even the Word of God here. Verse 14, I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the Word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Do not love the world, Or the things in the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust and the lust of the eyes, and the lust and the lust, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Let me go to the notes so I can explain a little bit of this, and we're going to get into some of the scripture. So it goes, the scripture goes along with the scripture. John speaks. James says something very similar. Peter says something very similar. Paul says something very similar. Why does it sound like these men are saying something very similar? Tell the different background. Same God. Same Holy Spirit moving them to write what he wants them them to write. Different audiences, though they are believers, to the world. If you're not a Christian, some of the stuff you might scratch your head and go, I don't get it. Well, join the crowd. I didn't get it either until I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. But the problem is, don't you want to get it? Why are you waiting to get it? You must receive the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I will not, the, the Bible is just a natural. You look at it and you go, I don't get it. It seems natural. It just seems like hocus pocus stuff. It sounds silly and foolish to a natural man or woman. But those of us that are born again, what does the Bible do? It becomes alive and it's actually active. It's, we know that actually the Bible changes our lives. We change our, our lifestyles. We, we, our likes and dislikes change and we want to focus on the things that bring God glory. You ever seen somebody's life change when they got saved? Somebody said, you should have seen them before they became a Christian. Oh yeah, listen, you're standing looking at one. I told the church a long time ago when I first got here, you have a junkyard dog as a pastor. If somebody tells you a bad story about me, Come see me. It's probably worse than they're telling you because they don't. They wasn't there. The only person that really holds most of the secrets, I think, anybody in the building besides the Holy Spirit, would probably be this guy sitting in with his arms crossed. My brother, he's seen more than the, than the world than anyone else has seen because we were kind of secretive. We were the preachers' kids after all, and uh, so the things you couldn't be called out in public, right? You had to. But he knows he's the holder of secrets. That he and the Holy Spirit. What I want you to see, his wife does know quite a few things as well. And sister does too, but I just, uh, the keeper sitting right there. The sensei is there. Here's what I want you to understand. God has forgiven me of my sins. God has forgiven you of your sins. If you've given your heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ, why would you not receive a free gift of salvation? Not only do you get forgiven of your sins, not only do you have the ability to abide in Christ, he abides with you to guide you, to walk you through this life, to answer your questions, to show you the way. And when you die and you are going to die, you have heaven as your promise forever. Amen. Well, I say heaven, and you have a new earth. You're going to be wherever God is, you're going to be forever. And you'll walk with him and you'll talk with him and you'll see the saints of glory. Why? Why in the world would you resist such a beautiful offer from an awesome, beautiful God? Let me show you the notes here. All peace today. As Christians, a Christian knows the Heavenly Father intimately through a love relationship with Jesus Christ and is therefore what? We're pardoned and released from our spiritual debt. By believing on the only begotten Son of God, our sins are forgiven. Did you know that's what Jesus came to this earth to do? To forgive and save sinners from their sin. Romans 6.23, you have it there. You can actually see the scriptures. The Bible says, for the wages of your sin is what? Death or hell. It's a separation. It's wherever God is, that sin is not. So wherever you don't like to say the word hell, it's a real word. So we say the, hell, we say the word hell in our church. Separated with God, God is in heaven. His throne is in heaven, the Bible says. And separated from God is in a place called hell. You can call it the pit. You can call it Hades. You can call it eternal separation from God. Ever how you slice it, it's going to be separated from God. You will not live in the presence of holy God. So the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. It's that separation. You will go there, wherever there is when you die. But the gift of God 
is eternal life, don't forget this, in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. You don't get the gift without the giver, and the giver is Jesus Christ. Is that oversimplified? Is that complicated? Why do we resist such an awesome, an awesome offer? Why would anybody in their right mind, now if you're delusional, I understand, but if you're in your right mind, why would you not receive the gift from the giver? He's in charge of everything. You say, well, I don't know enough. He didn't say, whoever knows enough shall be saved. Verse 13 in Romans says, six, uh, look at it, says, 10, 13 says, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If there was a fire here right now, we saw a fire blazing back here, and you had your cell phone, uh, what have we been trained to do? Call 911. And if you didn't, listen, you'd be complicit with the fire, I think, if you had the ability to not do it. I mean, the ability to do it and you didn't do it. So why in the world, when God gives us something greater than even helping someone with a fire, call 911, just call to him and say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. Would you forgive me of my sins? Would you cleanse me and, and come into my life? And when you ask him that question, the answer is always 100% yes. It is written that he says, yes, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, the good news is when you're saved, now we get in and we get to swim a little bit where John's at. What's this? John, he's going to encourage, 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 and then he's going to warn and warn, okay? Just go, just know that's coming. John encourages those spiritually mature because of their experiential knowledge of the eternal God of creation. He says, you know him. Fathers, you know him. They have pursued God as father through their lifestyle. They know God through his holy word. These are people that are on the top, if you will, of the Christian food chain. They're the most humble people you will see. When you ever, someone has a question, uh, they go and say, uh, hey, let's go ask brother so-and-so. Let's go ask sister so-and-so. And usually they're aged people. Not always, but they uh, usually are, they, they've lived life. And they live life with Christ. They've had experiences where the word of God has changed their life. They've had experiences where they were in trauma and God's brought them through. They were in, they were in a place of illness and the great physician healed them. They've been through some stuff, but they always, honey, Let's go to the Word of God. You got somebody like that in your life? You don't know what to do. You don't know how to do. Right? Today, usually what we do, if we have a problem, what do we do? Have a problem. ISO, help. And we text the whole world and want to know what the world thinks instead of going to the Father. He tells you, listen, it is written here, 66 books. You have a library in your hand. It is written from God how to deal with what you're dealing with. Every single thing you're dealing with. And I've told you, I'm of that crazy belief that every prayer you will ever request is already answered in the Word of God. Because if you come to me for advice or counsel, you go, Pastor, what should I do? I'm going to say, hey, a minute, let's, let's talk to the Father, and then let's go to his Word. Right? What does his Word say? You say, well, my problem is not explicitly listed there. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and lean not on your own understandings. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Where does that come from? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Go and look for yourself. If you trust in the Lord with all of your heart, does that take care of most people's problems? The problem is we don't trust. The problem is we want the answer. We want it fixed our way. What about Paul? Did Paul want his thorn in the flesh fixed? What did God say to him? My grace is sufficient for you. Listen, just go. Get up, whatever it is, if it's limping, limping. If it's gimping, gimping, right? Get up and limp, get up and gimp for the Lord. And do what he said to do his way. And who's going to carry him through? Paul made a promise. The Lord seen me through, right? I'm in spiritual warfare at all times. I've been shipwrecked. I've been snake bitten. I've, I've been beaten. I've been stoned. But, you know, the Lord is faithful. He's faithful. Let's continue. What's this? I want you to see this. John encourages those that are persistently growing, and they after it, they want it, growing in their spiritual maturity. These are those young men that John's talking about. They resist temptation or are victorious over the evil one through their faith in Jesus Christ. They continue to grow in their faith because the word of God abides in them. You cannot, you cannot succeed as whatever success is in your mind this year or this world or this life. You cannot succeed, succeed as a Christian unless you abide in the word of God and his word abides in you. 
Well, how do we take this written document, these written 66 books, and take them from this printed page and put them in our minds and in our hearts? You must read it. Romans 10 tells us clear. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing how? By the word of God. You want to increase in your faith? You want to be like these young ones, right? These young men who are these maturing ones. You want to be maturing in your faith? Read God's word. Allow it to abide in you. And listen, and turn back around. Whenever you speak God's words, people will say to you, and I didn't realize it happened when I was, after I became a Christian, every time you talk about stuff, you always bring in Scripture. If you want me to say it, I'm going to get us both in trouble, right? If it comes out of my knowledge, what's going to happen? I'm going to tell you to do the wrong thing. I'm going to tell you, instead of going to the Lord, I'm going to tell you, let's go to the doorstep. Let's fight. My first nature is don't fight. Let's fight it. Let's go through it head and head, and let's do it with fists, right? If we lose, we lose. At least we know we had fun doing it, right? But they'll have a knocked out tooth or a black eye tomorrow, right? That's my nature. And God's nature is what? Let me have it. Vengeance is mine, saith what? Or who? The Lord. So when you go to the Word of God, it's like almost everything opposite how our natural being thinks. We want to fix it. He says, let it go. We want to solve it. He says, leave it unsolved. We want the answer. He says, I'm going to leave it a question for now because you need to mature just a little bit more. We don't like it necessarily. If you like everything in the Word of God, either you're so spiritual you're just about ready to go or you're lying. Because when I come across stuff, I'm like, Man, why does God say that? When I read Jesus was told to turn the other cheek, that's one thing I didn't like. When I was a kid, I'm like, oh, Jesus, you had the power. You could have went, could have called James and John over, and they could have shot them down because they were the sons of thunder, right? That's what he called them. He, he knew how they were wired. He knows how you're wired. Listen, he loves us anyway, but these young men, these young spiritual mature ones or maturing ones, they're persistently, they're, they won't stop. They want to know the word of God. They want to know him and make him known. They want, to, they want to know more about the power of the resurrection. They want to know Jesus. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, Paul even writes, listen, listen, when you've done everything, stand, be aware there's a spiritual warfare, and, that, and I put that in there so you'll look at it when you get home. There's a warfare going on around us. It's not those missiles coming out of Iran. It's not those missiles coming out of anybody's uh, uh, turrets or guns. Listen, the warfare is happening all around us. I've done it before, and, and it's hard to find them now, but if I brought a radio in here, and I just an old radio, and just turned the dial, what would we catch that's going through right through here right now? It's invisible. What would you hear? Radio waves, you'd hear country music. You'd hear, if I keep turning, I've done it before. You'll hear rock and roll. Uh, you'll hear classic. You'll hear Christian music. Whatever, ever how slowly you turn the dial is how many signals you'll pick up whatever's coming through the building. It's happening right now. While you're sitting here, all those radio waves are either going through you or bouncing off your head. Did you know that? You're getting, you're getting and all the stuff from the internet, the cell towers right there. How many things are people sending up to that is getting broadcast out or received? Y'all do know that your phone is a receiver, right, and a transmitter, and it will burn a hole in your stuff back in the day, right? Put it back here. You have a stuff mark one of these days. Put it here. People in California, they're complaining of tumors now. What's happening? You're, you do have a transmitter that sends an unnatural signal through your head because it can't go there until it goes through this, right? You do know that. What I want you to understand, listen, it's happening all around us. We can't see those radio waves. If we don't see it, guess what? We just... We don't see it. We just act like it's not there. But Paul tells us there's a spiritual war going on constantly around us. And then he tells us even something more. There's a spiritual war going on inside of me. The Holy Spirit saying, live holy because I'm holy, says the Lord. And the flesh is like, fight it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's, not this time. Let's just this time. Let's do it our way. And you have this friction that's always pushing you, making decisions where you'll spend your money, how you'll be in your relationships, how you'll attend church or be with other people. You'll constantly have that battle. So the war is inside, the war is outside, and the war is all around you. And listen, it's spiritual in nature. So read that when you get a chance to get home. Go to, I want you to see next encouragement before the warning. John encourages those who are new believers, those spiritually immature. They have placed their faith in Jesus through the witness of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Let's go to 1 Peter. Uh, let's look it up. Do we have 1 Peter up on the screen by chance? I didn't ask you all to put that in today, but let me go over it. Read First Peter. All right, here it is up on the screen. Look up on the screen with me. We'll read it quickly this way. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Isn't that funny? 
men would wear these kind of, and women would wear these kind of, I call them tutus or nighties or something. They would wear they would wear this nice linen, and they would if they had to get somewhere, they would pull it up, put their belt on, and they would gird up. They'd get ready for work. All right, it means get ready. You're getting ready to do something that's not the daily normal. You're actually getting ready to do something that's going to be require heavy lifting, maybe not running necessarily, but speeding up or fighting. You have to gird up your loins. So Peter starts out with gird up, if you will, your mind, the loins of your mind. Can you see that? He's telling you, get your, get your thinking right, right? Quit your stinking thinking and start thinking right. Think what, how God would want to think. All right. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's continue. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust. We're going to cover those lusts here in just a moment. We just read it. As in your ignorance, when you did it because you just did it because that's what you do because it felt good, you liked it, and you thought that's what it was pretty, and so you touched it, right? But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy how? You say, this is impossible. You're exactly right. It is absolutely impossible to do what you and I just read. What I just said is impossible on your own. But the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who in which gives me strength. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. And if you call on the, uh, on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, accord, uh, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in hell. Listen, y'all, look, you see the words. These words are true for you and me, knowing that you are not redeemed with the corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers. We talked about that a little bit a few weeks ago. But with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. I'll stop there. What I want you to see is, listen, the intent that God wants you to understand is you can't do it by yourself. There is nothing you possibly can do. You have nothing to offer God. Your time, talent, resources come from where? God. They're his stuff. He's allowing you to be a steward of his stuff. How you doing? How you doing with his stuff? Are you a good steward of his money? Are you a good steward with his houses and his cars and things that he's given you? Are you a good steward with your life? Listen, it's his stuff. I want you to see this. Now the warnings come from John. John warns believers, do not love the world of sin that opposes God and his precepts, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Go back and look at those top three that he says over there. Uh, let's go ahead and go to your notes. He warns, John warns everyone of all ages against loving the things of this world that are not of the Father. He lists them. The lust and sensual craving of the flesh, the lust and longing of the eyes, and the pretentious confidence in one's resources or the stability of earthly things. You think you made it? I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. How foolish can you possibly be? Do you remember the, the story that Jesus told the story? There was, a, there was a man, he was he had a bumper crop. He was a wealthy farmer, had a nice barn, but he had too many resources that the barn wouldn't hold him. The barn was full. And he tore down his barn, and he built a new barn, and the Lord calls him a fool because, listen, his life was required of him at that very moment. What should he be done with it? We ask children this, and what do children say? He should have... Shared, given it away. He should have gave out the excess away. But he wanted to keep it for himself. He was greedy and he died that day in, in the Lord's story. How does God want us to live? Generous living. Listen, that is true. He wants us to give it away. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life in Jesus Christ. That's Jesus' own words. He said that himself. He said that of the Father and he said that of himself, that you can have eternal life because he is a giver who gives generously, abundantly, without measure. And you go, but I can't measure up to that. The answer is you can't. You can't do any of this I'm saying. You can't do it. You are disqualified, FYI, unless you have the Lord Jesus Christ living in through you. Then the Holy Spirit, like you would a puppet, if you look at a puppet, and I even commented, Wendy and I were at Walmart last night doing some things, and I went to the toy section, and, I, and of course I don't buy toys because I'm way out of that league, but I'm like, these toys look so stinking real. I mean, they look like a, what you would think of a dinosaur or whatever. I mean, they look so real. And I'm like, where was this stuff when I was a kid? I had to use it in my imagination. Now it's like it's there. 
And so I, I couldn't believe how, how real it looked. But there was even this one, like, big plastic puppet thing you stick your hand in. It was a dinosaur. You kind of grab it like this. And the only reason I know because Wendy went a couple aisles over and I couldn't find her, so I squeezed the bike horns, waka waka, right, real loud. I whistled in the store, and I was over there playing with toys uh, while I was waiting for her to come over to the, where the noise was. And I'm like, how cool is this thing? And if I was a kid, I would take that thing to school because it's this big. What would you do? With, what is the natural thing to do with a toy like that? If it has big teeth and it's got a mouth and you open it, you can open and shut it. What, what is the natural thing to do? To bite your brothers and sisters, right? And to bite your classmates with that thing. And just shove it and let it clamp down. And just to bite people with it. That's, that's what it's for, right? That's what it looked like it was for anyway. But I want to tell you, that thing, I walked past it. I was like, man, that thing looks real. You know, when I mess with it, it wasn't animated at all unless I put my hands in it. It's like a puppet. You and I are very much like that way. We are made in the image of God. We are the top of his creation. But we did sin, listen, because Adam and Eve sinned. And all of us, that's our grandpa and grandma. Because everybody has always sinned. We were born into sin. We are useless to the kingdom until the Lord, not a puppet, but he puts his spirit inside of us and says, now talk and walk this way. But Lord, I can't. You're right. You can't. You can't do anything he says until he says to do it. You don't become his puppet. We sang a song earlier, and, and I thought about how hard it is to commit that I will do this to the Lord. Here's how I pray. God, I want to know you. I really do want to know you with all my heart, even better and better every day. I want to love you, and Lord, I want to obey you for the rest of my life. And I will do this if you will help me. Because if you don't help me, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to constantly revert back to the ways that I used to be, right? I thought you got better when you get older. FYI, you get worse. You get meaner. You're more obstinate. Some of y'all are looking very pious at me. Listen, you do get better, obviously, when you mature in your faith. But the human nature is like, ah, forget about it. I don't want to go over there. Let's just stay home tonight, right? And the Bible says fellowship together. What do we do? Young people are like, yeah, we're having a pizza party. We're going out and do this. And, and, then, and then young adults are like, hey, we're going to have coffee. You guys want to have coffee? And when you get older, you're like, eh, I have coffee in the morning. <laughs> right? We, we, if you're not careful, we'll just get into that mindset. The Holy Spirit has the unction us to move. Get up. Do it. Because our nature is to whatever comforts me. There's a warning. Stay with the precepts of God. The world hates the things of God. There's, there's actors and famous people today saying, I'm a Christian too. Be like me. Stay away from those people. Don't follow those people. Listen, follow the word of God. Be holy as he is holy, says the Lord, because he will help you in due season. Listen, he knows and he loves you. All right, John warns against that pretentious confidence in my stuff, this lust, what I see, what I have. You know what? I'm not worried about what that preacher says. Don't worry about what I say. Worry about what the word of God says. I shouldn't say worry. Worry is a sin. You better be concerned about what the word of God says. He says don't love the things of this world. Because will this world take you away? If you're not careful, listen, this is not down on, by the way, this is not Baptist preacher down on day, right? We're not down on your stuff. But if you're not careful, you'll start adding to your stuff. You'll get so much stuff that your stuff has you. Is that true? Because, like, listen, I'm going to get another motorcycle soon, I hope. <clears throat> if I get a motorcycle, what is the natural thing to do? You got to go for long rides, fast, long rides, right? And, and then campers, if you got a camper, what's the natural thing to do? Go camping. And if you have a boat, what's the natural thing to do? Go boating. If you have skis, natural thing to do is find someone to pull you, right? Or go skiing down a, a, a mountain, right? And all those take time. And what do we normally do during the week? We normally work. And then the weekend's the only time we have. So therefore, one weekend's not bad. Listen, go spend family time. Two weekends is not necessarily bad. But when that stuff gets a hold of you, what happens? Your life starts getting out of, out of sync, does it not? And you leave God behind and you love the things of the world. And be careful, don't love the things of the world because it's evident. God will convict you and you'll change. You'll use it for his glory or you'll walk far away from God. And you see people that it's like, used to be, they used to come to church all the time. Next Sunday when more bombs drop, church will be full next Sunday, right? Spring break will be over. And there'll be more bombs dropped this week, and people think, is Jesus Christ coming back now? I better get to church. 
By the way, if you read verse 18, and you'll see, you'll think I'm just this greatest guy who knows everything that's going on. If you look at verse 18 next week, let me just go ahead and give you a preview. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming, and as even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know this is the last hour. Spooky. How did the preacher land on this? Everybody's thinking the bombs. Jesus has come back. Hey, I got news for you. Jesus is coming back. And we are seven days closer this Sunday than we were last Sunday. Paul preached it. John preached it. James preached it. Listen, preachers, I'm preaching through the ages. And Peter even says, be careful. Some people say, you've been saying he's coming forever. And the moment you get relaxed and say, he's not coming, at least not now, behold, the time is here. Brothers and sisters, listen, be able to look at the news, filter it, but see the news through the word of God. Jesus Christ is coming. Don't panic. That's what we've been praying for. Have you not prayed, come, Lord Jesus, come? So read Revelation. It'll, it'll, that's how we end. The world is passing away, and with its shameful pursuits and ungodly longings, but the one who does the will of God and abides in him has eternal life. Eternal life. Isn't that an amazing thing about James, if you go through, and I didn't have this in your notes. If you're taking notes, go ahead and write this down. This is important to write down. James chapter 1, verse 19 through 22. James 1, 19 through 22. And basically the bottom line is he ends up with saying, hey, be doers of the words, not hearers only. Not hearers only. And finally in Ephesians 2, 4 through 10, Paul tells us, it's, listen, it's God's grace. That's the reason that you're saved. Your faith that he gives you through his grace Right? Not of work, so you can't boast. It is the gift of God. So God gave you the gift of faith. God has given you, extends the gift of grace. Will you make application? Or will you walk out of here another Sunday and go, that was pretty good. I don't think I got it all together. You don't have to have it together. You just have to believe what he says. You have to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You already got the hard part done. You know that you're a sinner, right? Look back up, go ahead and close your eyes and look back this week. Any sins in traffic, any sins in relationship, it's pretty clear, right? You can, if, if God measured them out, you're like, whew, should have known my thoughts yesterday morning, right? Should have heard us coming to church today. We're about ready to kill the kids. Hurry up, we got to get to church, right? Y'all straighten up. Get your clothes on. Get that room picked up, right? We know, we know how we talk and how we treat others. Here's what the Lord wants you to know. He understands. He does love you. But he does have a standard of holiness that he requires you to live by. And you can't get it until you give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. And then once you, listen, once you have it, he'll list you here. You'll be little children. Hey, be sure that your sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ. That's the mature, immature believer. That's the new Christian. Or it could be, unfortunately, you can get older and never grow in your faith because you don't read the word of God. It, it's a sad thing to see an older, older man or woman and you ask them a tough question about the spirit of God. And they're like, I don't know. Ask the preacher. So the worst thing you possibly say, you are the minister of the gospel that God's called you to be in your family. If you're a Christian, you're the minister. You're the answer. Go to the word. Listen, even Google. I'm telling you, you can Google today. I'm trying my best to make Google and Siri Christians. Be ye doers of the word. James chapter 1, verse 19. Isn't it sad that technology knows more about the scripture than God's people? You've got to know his word. Put it in. You might not know the chapter and verse, but you know what it says. Finally, he says, you've been saved for those good works to do. That's the will of God. The will of God is this. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Be forgiven of your sins and have eternal life. Follow through. The will of God is to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Listen, that doesn't save you, but that lets you be obedient to Jesus. And then third, the will of God is to learn his ways and learn the word of God. Hide his word in your heart that you might not sin against him. This is the will of God. And do and exercise those things that only God says you can do. Let me tell you a quick story, and I'm going to pray and give us an invitation, because we always want to invite people to receive Jesus Christ. Mackenzie shared with me this morning, and Chris, she jumped in, she, she shared with me, they were going to go share with students at a school, end up, one of the teachers, there's another connection that was at the school, is now going to another school. So their, their influence has gone from 100 school kids to now 302 school children of influence they'll have access to when they go uh, on their mission trip to Thailand here in June coming up. So God just exponentially grew the whole plan by three times. And not only three times, usually those children have at least one or two parents, right? 
So 300 becomes potentially 900. And if they tell their grandparents, they potentially become, you see the numbers keep growing. So their influence has gone well over 1,000 if you count everybody who would say, what are those white people doing here? Right? Or I guess it's all, you got all white people going with you this time? We got every skin color in the church, right? But when you go and you're different, everybody knows you're different. What are those Americans doing here? What are those Europeans doing here? What are you doing here? We're sharing the love of Jesus Christ. Look how his influence just grows because we're faithful. Church, we're sending them on their mission trip. Our, our Town Creek Baptist Church sends people 100% on their mission trip. Listen, we'll pay for the airfare, we'll pay for the hotel, we'll pay for your food. Any trinkets, you can buy those on your own. But if you're willing to go, and that's why we say get your passport because this is what we're talking about. It's not just some 2,000-year-old scripture we're talking about. This is real life. It makes application here in Aiken, but it also makes application around the world. You know what? We serve an awesome God. If you know him, listen, you can say amen to that. But if you don't know him, listen, let it be today. Give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. There is a starting point for every Christian. We all start at the same place. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much that you love us and care for us. I thank you that you have a plan and a purpose. You have a will. Lord, much higher purpose and will than us. Lord, we just want to get through this week. We just want so-and-so saved. And Lord, we're praying for one person, and you might have thousands of people for us to be a witness to. Open our eyes, but Lord, let us see clearly that we must be holy as you're holy, and we can't do that on our own. It must be through the power and through the love of the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, that even my words or anyone's words, no matter what education or lack of, can explain you. We can just tell what your word says because your word is true. You are faithful forever faithful, and we thank you. And Lord, I pray today if there's somebody who has never given their heart and life to Jesus Christ, they have deep questions, deep cuts in their heart, Lord, of, of a past religious event. Lord, we're not talking about religion. We're moving on from that mess. We're talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And Lord, walk in daily with you. Break that heart. Help that soul that's near as hell today. Mend relationships. Let forgiveness flow freely like a fresh creek in our lives today. O oh Lord, creator God is in charge of the sun, moon, and stars, the creator of those very beings. For today, we praise you, we thank you. Father, we want to do your will. Help us not love the things of this world, but help us love you first. Help us put you in right priority. In Jesus' name we pray for his sake. Amen.